here we are. He exists. I do indeed. I'm right in the room where we've been rehearsing for the last couple of weeks. Well, that's cool. How the how the rehearsals going? Really what? terrible. 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 It's, I don't think it's, there's going to be a show. It's all <laughs> off. I can't do it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's really it's been great actually. We the the show we're really kind of going all out for this one. Uh-huh. Um, and then if you can kind of see these these uh, big sort of light tower things that I've got that I've repurposed from a sort of auto body shop light thing. And uh, one of the purposes they listed uh, that you could, one of, the, or one of the functions for which you could use the lights was, quote, indoor DIY. So I thought, well, <laughs> that seems about right. That's kind of broad, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. That's definitely, Rock Tour definitely counts as indoor DIY. <laughs> This seems and, like you uh, could do a lot with this album. I mean, I guess you could do a lot with all of your albums. And are you just now finally taking that opportunity to visually, yeah, to to go big? Well, I mean, we have to go big without a lighting designer. You know, we're still touring in a van, uh, maybe with a trailer. So it's it's uh, you're really kind of limited in terms of what you can do if you're just trying to make sounds. Um, we, we're we're taking one support person uh, who will yeah. be the the front of house. You, know, you can kind of you can take one. You can take a tour manager, uh, a sound guy or 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 gal, or a, a lighting guy or gal. And I feel like sound is probably the best place to put, you know, that that investment. Right. That's, so that's, the rest of us are left to run all this stuff. It's funny. I'm, th- I'm thinking of uh, you know the uh, like in a high school or a college when you you want to have a, a party and you go to your local renter. You know, and you're like, I'm going to rent a little disco ball, and and, and the lights yes. that just kind of change automatically on their own, and ta-da. it's exactly like that. It is 100 percent like that. <laughs> it, it's super, super low budget, but uh, it's really fun, and the lights actually look great. I got these tube gels from Chinatown that I stuck into things, and we spray painted them, so they look suddenly very kind of like, I don't know, look like something Darth Vader would have in his boudoir, and um, and then I've also got lasers. I got these laser gloves from China. Gloves. Yeah, yeah, they, 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 they yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, Mick Jagger always did the pointing and thing. I, I think you could really turn that into something else. You know. Yeah, like the, I point at you and, and blind you for the rest of your life. Right. Yeah, that was the thing. In uh, was it Wayne's World? You know, being at the Pink Floyd show and wanting the laser to be in your eye and on your face. <laughs> you know, we had to be kind of. And, you know, I don't think these things were really made with safety in mind, so I'm pretty sure that some of them could burn a hole through something if you, if you held it on there for too long. So we're having to we're practicing where we aim them in the in the show. That's a, that's they that's, come in, out very much, but they are real. I'm not kidding. Yeah, that's that's what your legacy is actually going to be. It's not going to be your music. Like, oh, Shearwater, awesome. that was the band that burned the hole in the dude's skull. No, no, not funny. <laughs> Everybody makes it out alive. Band, audience, everyone. All of this work that you've done, it's 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 gone. You know, it's like, oh yeah, yeah, we're the band. It's like it's like uh, thinking of a uh, was it, uh, Great White? Wasn't that the uh, the uh, the eighties yeah, band with the band fire and everything? Like that's what they're known for now. You know, it's. Oh. I don't it's wish that on you. Funny to you, I don't know. <laughs> it's don't. A, it's a little too close to home. I, I mean, I don't I don't have too much in common with Great White. I don't think, but but. <laughs> Whoops. You know, I've now been at this for long enough to be not a tourist anymore, you know. Right, right. And good for you. We can actually jump into it from, from that point right there because it's true. Yeah. You guys have been in it for, for a long time now. You've been doing this for a long time, and Sub Pop, your record label, is calling this your career-defining album right here. Like, that's some good stuff, probably a little bit of pressure, or maybe it's exactly what you want right now. Oh, sure, why not? <laughs> at this point, I don't... I don't want to say that I don't care because I care uh, a lot, maybe more than ever. But at the same time, I, you know, I don't know if I'm at the I'm at the height of my powers musically, but I definitely feel like I can see that from here. Mm-hmm. And um, having done this for so many years, I've learned a lot of what not to do. Um, and it, it's fun to, to it's, rehearsals are especially fun for that reason because you can. You make the kind of decisions that you that you wouldn't have known to make in earlier years. Like, hey, wait a minute, let's practice real quiet and make everything real good, and then get louder and louder and louder instead of you know, right, putting it through months of just screaming volume and uh, and trying to hear what's going on and not knowing. Uh, so there's, I mean, I'm going to turn forty on this tour. Is that right? 
Uh-huh. I had no clue on that one. Yep. I actually thought we were uh, closer in age. I'm 34. I, I think I had it in my head that we were like around the same same age. But well, uh, you can you can think that if you want. It's just fine with me. <laughs> you don't look a day over 34. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> That's it, true, though. It's uh, you know, every I'm astonished that it's gone on for this long, but I'm really glad that it has because I feel like I've been able to get to a point where, um, you know, I've just it's it, it's rare to be really good at something right out of the box. Um, I I feel like people want want to see like the, a band's first record being the, the thing that is their best work somehow, and occasionally the universe aligns and it is. But I think it's more likely. Um, that if you give people a chance to develop over time, they're going to improve, uh, and you know I, th- I think our I think our records have gotten better over time. Yeah. And this one, I'm I'm especially proud of this record. I, th- I think it's I think it's the best one. Yeah. I and I agree because for me, I mean, Animal Joy was such an important record to me the year it came out. Like I oh, thank you. played that record so many times. The way you play a record that you're you know completely obsessed about. Uh, yeah. And when you find uh, an album like that from a band and then time passes and you hear, OK, the band's going to do another record and you start to get a little bit nervous, you know, you, you know, that feeling. Like, OK, well, <clears throat> put a lot of emotion into this. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I hope it doesn't suck and just ruin that record for me. And, and thank oh, no. God, this is such a good record. I mean, I, sh- I should show this on the camera here. This is great. Uh, the, uh, the jet plane and Oxbow with the, uh, the picture. It's a, a human argument, right? Yeah, that's what that yeah. is. Did you did you know that piece before you? No, uh, luckily you wrote it in your liner notes. Oh, okay, right. Yeah, that, that's. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say, wow. That I mean, Agnes, Miss Dennis, who who made that piece, uh, is a really interesting sort of conceptual artist. She's in her eighties now. Um, she d- did some really great projects. She most famously planted a field of wheat in the Battery in in New York uh, back in the eighties, and. Uh, she also she did a project where she was at the American Academy in Rome, and she was supposed to do a, a piece about uh, human impact on the environment. And what she did was she brought a flock of sheep to the grounds of the academy and let them eat the ornamental garden. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's punk rock art right there. That's uh... exactly. I loved it. I just loved it. And she designed that uh, uh, that object there, which is made out of neon. Yeah. Um, but then uh, my friend Matt Dilling actually made the. Object. It's he did the actual neon fabrication on it, which is how I found out about it. Oh wow! And well, so it's, I, I haven't I haven't seen it in person, but I think it's about five feet tall, uh, and I like it looks like it's just a graphic image. But if yeah. you look at it more carefully, you can. See it's an actual it's real a thing. Physical. Yeah. yeah, that should be in your practice room at this point. <laughs> uh, I don't think I could afford it. <laughs> Well, I, I know uh, you know. There's already been a lot of talk about the uh, this album being a thematic record and everything, and I guess that really sums it up, right? A human argument. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's. I mean, I wanted to make it a. a I read a uh, not read. I guess I heard there was an inter- interview disc that they put out with Scary Monsters mm-hmm. uh, when it came out in 1980, where Bowie said that uh, it was social protest music. Yeah, and I thought. What? <laughs> and so I went back and listened to it again, thinking of it with that in mind. And uh, it really is, actually. Um, but it's sort of an oblique social protest record uh, that, that has a lot of room for you to participate in it, mm-hmm. which is the problem with protest music a lot of the time. It's just somebody shouting slogans at you, and you're like, oh, make that person go away. <laughs> and uh, so I, I thought it would be really satisfying to make a record like that mm-hmm. uh, in the sense of a record that kind of probes some of the pathologies of our wonderful country <laughs> um, but but that still um, leaves room for you to, to place yourself inside it and interpret it for yourself too. Well, it, it's a dark record. I, I don't mind saying that because you know going through the lyrics and everything you know the few words that come up time and time again uh, guns, lies, uh, it seems like there's blood in every scene. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of blood in the record. And every turn, but, like I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't automatically say that this is an optimistic record for our future. Not necessarily, but it's not without, um, it's not without compassion, though. Uh, I mean, I, I really like the United States. Is the problem? It'd be easy to just condemn it, um, but. I mean, songs like "Only Child" or, or "Wildlife in America" um, are, uh, 
I think very very compassionate. They're they're they were made with. Um, I don't know, compassionate in the way that like an intervention is compassionate or something. Sure. You know? An intervention with the entire country. That's uh, Well, who knows? I, 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 that's probably not a good analogy. It's, no, that's not for me to do that. I, I do get the sense, though, that there, there is a bit of a, when, when you pull back from it all, that um, that what you're saying, and, and I don't know if you are or not, but I would agree this, maybe this is my own projection into this record, but that it's all just completely silly. Like all this stuff that's happening, the political system, whatever, it's just ridiculous. Oh yeah, now is well, now is a good time for this record to come out. It, it's, it's it's funny because we wrapped it almost a year ago, um, yeah. but I'm I'm glad that we waited till now to for it to come out. Um, but in you know, the election season is the time when the national id comes screaming out of the attic and onto the streets, and it's always this way. I think it's probably healthy actually because it lets us see ourselves for for what we are. Um, yeah. You know, this stuff is always there. It just kind of gets amplified in this in this time. Um, but you know, underneath all of the all of this is that the, there is a um, you know there's there's a there's a humaneness to the United States that we show in fits and starts um, that can be really startling and wonderful. Um, and I wanted the record to embody that some also. I mean, the thing is, like in the course of doing the the work that I do both touring the band and then doing the research stuff for the books and that kind of thing. Um, I get to spend a lot of time outside the country and I get to have that experience fairly often of coming back to it. And for those first few days, it seems like just another place, you know, yeah. you feel like you were coming home, but then you get home and suddenly it's, it's weird. There's something strange about it or the, you see things that are beautiful or ugly about it that normally you just ignore because you're there all the time. Right. And so I wanted the record to kind of live in that space because I think that's actually a very valuable perspective. Even though, when you're in it, you, I kind of want to, you know, <laughs> just want to settle back out and feel like I'm home again. No, I, I do see you. I, I see you as a world traveler more so than most musicians because a lot of musicians would they would go home after a tour and they would just go to their room and that's where they would stay for the next year and a half until the next record. But you do get out there and and I don't know because you know seeing it as an American, and then seeing America as an outsider might, <clears throat> at least a little glimpse of it. Yeah, I mean, does it so. ever seem like, you know, America is just baby Huey at this point, and we're just going around and we're sitting on things, you know? And, <laughs> and just Well, part of what makes us, you know, so much like sometimes watching a train wreck is that because we're so powerful, uh, still, our, our uh, you know, our, our mistakes and just everything we do is amplified. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think we're particularly different necessarily from any other place in the world. It's just that because we're so big, um, what, what we do matters by default sometimes. Uh, and and that you realize that, that other people in the world have to pay, often feel that they have to pay attention to us whether they want to or not. Right. Um, because of that, and that's uh, uh, you can see where you can see where the resentment would start to creep in. Like any, you know, everybody knows people like this. You know, they come into the room and they're just like all the air gets sucked out of the room. It's like, oh god, you know, Steve's here. We're all gonna have to pay attention to Steve now. You know? <laughs> but you've got the lyric in there too. Yeah, like, and and I've seen it on the walls where it says "Yankee Go Home." You know, when I've been in Europe, home, like yeah. like that made it into one of your songs too. Like, yeah, um, I mean, well, well that that song. Um, uh, radio silence is, is I was thinking about the the number stations you know that that uh, broadcast the messages to the various intelligence agencies they still exist you can find them on shortwave radio they just send codes and you know in strange voices and things they're really often very eerie sounding um, but some of them have gone dark over time and some of new ones have popped up and there was there was one called the Lincoln Trocher that was broadcast out of uh, Cyprus but it seems to have been like an MI5 kind of thing um, and because it would always, it, its broadcast would always announce themselves with a, a little phrase from this English folk song, the, the little chair poacher, which goes, and but then that station went dark not that long ago, and I feel like we're entering a time when um, you know some of the the ways pe things have been arranged throughout the 20th and early 21st century are being are are changing um, things that we had held to aren't aren't necessarily so anymore, um, and, and uh, it, which is exciting and frightening because it's 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 up to us to figure out what the new 
the new way that things should be. Right. Um, so that's, uh, that's sort of that song was coming from. Yeah. Uh, and part of that, you know, just in, in a geopolitical sense, is that the uh, sort of Pax Americana may not be a, the defining feature of the 21st century. It may have to be something else, but we'll see. Yeah. With your music, you know, you mentioned Scary Monsters, and I think Bowie is kind of in everybody's mind at this point. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and there's always been some kind of comparison or lineage from Bowie to Shearwater through the years, which may be why I'm such a big fan of you all. But, you know, <laughs> what you're talking about, um, Quiet Americans, I mean, am I wrong by also drawing the line to their song, to his song, I'm Afraid of Americans? I mean, there's a very obvious uh, thing with the title there, but it seems like that's... They have the word, it has the word American, but, but I wasn't directly thinking of his song for that song. Yeah. Uh, also, that's the, um, that's sort of the wrong period, um, for, well, sh- for this sure. record. Yeah, right. It's trying to keep the, keep the record sort of centered around, um, around 1980 because, not because I'm nostalgic for that time or anything, I was four, but you weren't even born yet. I was born, right? no, or, I was born in 81, so I would have just come right okay, after right. that. Yeah. And the, uh, uh, but but there was a um, there was the paranoia. There was sort of late Cold War paranoia was still in full swing then, and and also there was a sense that technology was about to change the world in this really fundamental way. But nobody really knew what it was, and so there's a lot of excitement and and um, and some terror about it. And I, I feel like it's a it's sort of analogous to the moment that we're in in a lot of ways. So I wanted to make a record that could kind of look at now through then, mm-hmm. sonically speaking. Um, but as far as Bowie goes, uh, you know, I went through my, my Bowie phase kind of late. Uh, it only, I mean, I listened to him in college, but I, there was always the, you'd listen to a greatest hits comp and you'd, mm-hmm. the, there was always this point where the song started to get kind of weird. <laughs> if you, if you were into the, to Ziggy Stardust, you know, and I was like, oh, this is, it just gets strange. And I only really picked up on what happened after that. Um, I don't know, five or six years ago yeah. and, and got into it more intensely and realized that that was actually the stuff that spoke to me most now. And oddly, one thing that we planned to do for months ago for this record, for the tour on this record, was to uh, perform the Lodger mm-hmm. record. Um, not necessarily all at once in a show, but like, you know, throughout the course of the tour, we were going to cover all the songs off the record. Because after I came back from a bunch of research traveling that was pretty scary, uh, I kind of just wanted to sit in a corner and cover myself with a blanket, and listening to that record somehow made me feel better. Yeah, I think because it's such a disoriented and confused-sounding record. Um, he has that line in Red Sails where he goes, "Boy, I really get around," you know, and the uh, so we spent time, you know, spending time charting out these songs and learning them, learning the parts, figuring out what makes them work. And then he died. And we thought for a minute about, oh, God, you know, should we still do this? Because um, it was just going to be a sort of funny thing to do. And, and then we're like, fuck, yes, we should yeah, do we this. We should definitely do this. <laughs> yeah, we should absolutely do this. Uh, and, but it's made rehearsing the songs really kind of moving in a way that I, had, I wouldn't have expected. Yeah. I think probably that will happen in the performances too. And it's such an interesting record that the band sounds very confused in it. I think they probably actually were some of the time. Because I think uh, Bowie and Eno were up in, you know, they were in that uh, studio in Switzerland, and mm-hmm. they, the control room wasn't connected to the, uh, by, by a window. Like, you couldn't see the musicians from the control room. So they had sort of a little video link thing, apparently. So they were kind of shouting instructions at the musicians who were down there in the <laughs> tracking room, you know. It just must have been so disorienting. And sometimes you feel like you listening, you can almost hear them kind of like giving up on the song. You'd be like, all right, I'm just going to play this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, all right, David. You well, know, spe- speaking of him, him and Eno, uh, completely underrated record with Outside, the one they did do in the 90s, not to bring it oh, back yeah. there and everything, but completely underrated record. Not that it has anything to do with what we're talking about here. Well, yeah, you know, the, I think that, that one got kind of got a little bit... Um, like the, the the concept kind of overwhelmed the songs in some ways. It could be uh, short. That's true. It would be definitely short, but it, but just it, it seemed so. Um, uh, the the concept seemed so imposed on it, and they they seemed to be getting off on that to such a degree that it was, yeah. it was sort of like the uh, the music got a little bit lost, I think, in the presentation of it. But yeah, there's there's always 
you know, there's always at least moments of brilliance on his on all of his right. records. Right. And um and I mean he just had such an incredible run and he was such an inspiring person. I mean I was telling somebody else this that like um the amazing thing to me is that everybody thought you know, as as strong a flavor as he was, as as intense as his care as he presented himself, um, everybody thought he was them. Like mm-hmm. everybody could see themselves in him right. somehow. And that was such a uh, you know, that was such a remarkable ability that he had. I think it, it's most remarkable ability, like beyond the, the costumes and the haircuts and all that kind of thing. It's it's people make so much of all these different characters, but I there's always something underneath it. Like there's, there's a, the consistency of him is the thing that you believe in. You know? yeah. and I mean, he's not like Daniel Day Lewis or something, you know. Like, but that but, guy. but see, that's that's the interesting part there too, because, you know, he he was all about the arts, and and when you have someone that I'm going to generically label weird, you know, against some other things. Uh, that shouldn't work out. Like, that shouldn't happen. That shouldn't work out that everybody could see themselves in him. But you're completely right. Yeah, everybody likes it. Yeah. You, know, yeah, but you, you could. There was something very... Um, uh, uh, I don't know, populist about him. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. Um, I, I wanna... I'm going to be thinking about him for a while. Yeah, that's true. Yes, that's true. <laughs> I do want to switch gears real quick on this, um, because you were yeah. talking about the traveling. And you do travel yeah. a lot. And and I'll preface this by saying that I have this weird, irrational fear. Not a real fear, but this odd thought in the back of my head that one day I'm going to be walking down the street <clears throat> and and on the around a corner that I can't see is just going to be a tiger waiting there. And that's how I'm going to meet my end, just a tiger. And I'm reading this that, was it a jaguar that walked up on you? Yeah. Um, <laughs> because that's my yeah. fear. Yeah, well... The, the- you're never going to meet a tiger. You can you can put that fear to rest. There's there's more tigers in captivity in Texas than there are in the wild, alas. But the um, uh, but the jaguar, yeah. I was in the Amazon um, with some friends back in June, and we were walking along this little uh, trail that that we just cut not not long ago. And they were looking for a, these were ornithologists, these hardcore ornithologists, and they were looking for a, a it might have been a white browed ant wren. It was a Little little brown bird that runs around in the understory, and they, were, they had their microphones out, their big uh, condenser microphones. They were just listening, and one of them was playing back calls of this ant rat. And we'd been standing there for maybe twenty minutes, or four of us. And suddenly, I looked, and there was this kind of red object coming towards us through the forest, so dense that you can't. I mean, it really is almost like one of those Rousseau paintings. Like you just take a few steps in any direction, you just get lost. Yeah. And I thought, is that a deer? Like, I just couldn't figure out what on earth this thing was. And then suddenly could see the rosettes on its fur. And I was like, holy, it's a jaguar. And the jaguar just stopped and looked at us. And we looked at it. And it kind of, it was like we were all kind of embarrassed. It was like, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Like, you know, like, like, I just don't think it was expecting to see us. <laughs> and, uh, and so it just, it stood there and looked at us. And we looked at it. And time just kind of stopped for a little while. And um, and eventually it just did. I, I never really saw it back away, but it somehow just disappeared. <laughs> and um, and then we sort of stood there for a little while longer. And then they, these guys, being who they were, they just kept on looking for the ant ran. But I was it was quite a feeling. It mm-hmm. was really something to see. You know, two hundred fifty pounds of cat. And uh, Brett, the guy who was leading the tour, has been working in the Amazon for thirty years, and he said he's only had something like that happen twice. Wow. Ever. I swear you're living like a Rudyard Kipling poem. <laughs> over and over. Down there it's possible. Yeah. It, it really... Like, that, how, how do you get it, to do all this traveling, by the way? Because, uh, again, you know, band, touring, cool. But you do yeah. so many interesting adventures out that, that I feel like that we get to go on, you know, vicariously. Uh, well, that, that's what I, I hope for, because, like, I, I don't like um, just going to do stuff for my... My own, I don't like hoarding experiences, and I really don't like tourism. Um, it's just not satisfying for me. Um, and uh, but also, I, like I don't have a trust fund or anything. The, the, <laughs> the way this worked in in particular was I I had some friends who do this work, um, so I was able to glom on. But also, I'm writing this book, and so I used uh, part of the advance from the book to to finance the trip. Yeah. Um, 
but that's the so, and, that, and that's how that happens. Uh, I know you've yeah. been talking about the book a lot too. You know, this is the people of. It's South- going to be a couple of years before it comes out. Yeah, that's so what I, mean, I was going to ask for. Like, is it is it coming out soon, or is this a different interview we get to do down the road? Yeah, we can talk about it later. I mean, a couple of years from now, because the yeah. thing is with books, the lead time is even longer than records. So you, right. you turn them in, and it's like a year before they even come out. Yeah, at least. Are Are you done with it at this point? No, no. Uh, the the I've got to, I've got to finish it this year. Basically, I yeah. turned in some chapters before the end of the year. But it's it it's a it's a crazy story. It's it's and, and really big. It's it's all about um, these ten super intelligent social birds of prey that only live in South America. Ten species called the caracaras, yeah. and how through them you can kind of see the entire uh, evolution of the wildlife and landscapes of the whole continent. And the thing about South America is that it was by its for more than 30 million years. It wasn't connected to North America. It wasn't connected to anything. It was like Australia, just out there. And it became its own planet, basically. And it only hooked up with North America a relatively short time ago, really about somewhere between 3 and 10 million years ago. So it, it kind of is a... Uh, these birds are a remnant of that world, the sort wow. of alternate version of Earth. Um, and so I'm going to use the book to, to tell that story. But also, you know, so I go to the places where they live and also hang out, you know, with the people who live around them, who are incredible characters. Yeah. I mean, I spent six weeks in going up a remote river in Guyana uh, back in April uh, with three Amerindian guys and a and a, 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 bio- a Canadian biologist, and it was, you know, it was one of the most fantastic trips of my life. It was incredible. Did you get any video of this? Like, could, could we? Is there going to be a visual aspect of the trip? There, I mean, there's a lot of photographs. Mm-hmm. I wasn't filming it, um, but I was writing. God, I. Just typing out all the notes for that, there was like like more than a hundred thousand words of just notes <laughs> from that trip. So much crazy stuff happened on that trip. Yeah. I've met the world's largest spider. That I, was cool. I, I know. I looked it up. Me and my son. I, I have an eight-year-old son, and yeah. you've done an interview where they ask you about your ten favorite animals of 2015 or something mm. like that. And the spider yeah, was yeah. the first one. And this is a bird-eating spider. So yeah, we had to look it up. And I'm going to tell you the look on my son's face was completely Please. worth this interview. By the way. <laughs> <laughs> you know that spider like I'm kind of scared of spiders um, that one it just sort of overloaded my phobia or something just was fascinated by it it's like I, didn't, a small I didn't want cat. it on me I'm like Sean <laughs> yeah it really they kind of don't even seem quite like a spider somehow yeah. but Sean uh, the, the biologist th- there was a picture attached to that right we can see it on his head mm-hmm. he wanted to his, uh, his girlfriend uh, is an arachnologist and studies black widow spiders and so he, when we found it, he um, he back put on his spider T-shirt that says "A spider did bite you," and uh, and we we got it onto him, and so it crawled up onto his head, and Sean just stood there beaming at me while I was snapping pictures at him with the camera, and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> "No, no, I did not want that thing on me." But it, it uh, you know, they're not poisonous; they're just scary. Yeah, that's still I don't know. That doesn't make me feel any better because you know I was reading about you saying that at some point, like here you are in a tent. You know, with these crazy tarantulas or whatever around you and everything. Yeah. Like, you've got to fall asleep somehow. Like, at some point, you just Dude. give in. Like, people have lived this way for a million years. Not yeah, with, well, not with yeah. long, long life expectancy, but they've lived. <laughs> I'm thinking about tarantulas are kind of... Somebody said the tarantulas are kind of boring, and they, they sort of are. They don't do that much. They, they, um, uh, they mostly just stay in one place and, and jump on things that come near them. So if you... You know, you know where they are. Uh, you're not likely to encounter them at night. It's amazing how in the in the forest down there, even with all the things that you know are around you, um, you get in your hammock and you you close up your mosquito net. And you're pretty much safe from all that's anything that might harm you. Yeah. Um. So you can you. I've slept really well in there. I was surprised. I'll, I really hope to uh, follow in your adventures on uh, some of these things someday because it all all these things that I read that's all all it does is like well I've got to put that now on my list of things I want to do. Yeah, you know, and Guyana, something else, man. That place is incredible. That it's uh, it's very very wild. Yeah. Um. And and also uh, the language is English. So even if you don't speak Spanish or Portuguese, mm-hmm. um, you can you can go into a part of the tropical forest that's as wild as any that there is. Um. It, it's it's probably the wildest part of all South America, the Guyana Shield region. And then, and then you wake up one day and you're back in your practice room, and and all the electrical yeah, outlets are, are back to normal. Like and and electric guitars and stuff. And yeah, yeah. It's I've I've really enjoyed getting. I mean, it's 
it's been a long time since I've gotten to play music consistently for day after day. Um, and the last couple of weeks of rehearsal has been really kind of rejuvenating in a way. I, I've, been, I've been surprised at how much fun it is. Well, now we've made it full circle back to your rehearsal, so I think that's a, uh, a good spot to wrap this up. But Jonathan, All right. this has been great. And again, Jet Plane and Oxbow, well, thank you. I love this record. And thank you so much for making it. Awesome. All right. We'll see oh, you man, around thank you. on the we, tour. Uh, yeah, we will do. All right. Bye, man. Take care, sir. Bye.